welcome to Gardening for Monarch Butterflies. And so today we're going to just talk a little bit about monarch butterflies. I want to say before we get started, as most of you probably know, if you're here in the DFW area, we are having some severe weather. So um, if anything happens to the internet while this is going on, um, just check your email tomorrow and I'll send out a video or something like that. So if anything cuts off, that is probably the issue. So um, thank you all for being here today. And I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. So um, this presentation is brought to you by Tarrant Regional Water District. And so before we start talking about monarch butterflies, I'm just going to talk a little bit about TRWD. And so uh, we have three different missions, and that is water supply, flood control, and recreation. And so basically, Tarrant Regional Water District is your raw water supplier. So you can see the map there on your screen. Those orange lines that you see are pipelines, and we maintain those pipelines and all of the surface reservoirs that you see or lakes that you see there um, also on the map. And we take, you know, store that raw surface water and we pump it from, you know, East Texas back up to Tarrant County. And then we provide that raw water to our Tarrant County cities. Um, and then those cities take that raw water and treat it to drinking water standards. And then the cities pipe it out to your homes and businesses. And so we're talking about, you know, Fort Worth, Arlington, Mansfield, all the smaller cities and everything that you, um, you know, that we have here in Tarrant County. And so um, that is our main mission. And then we also provide flood control. So we maintain all the levees and everything that are around the Trinity River to make sure that that doesn't flood and then recreation as well. So we have the Trinity Trail system and several parks and things like that associated with our lakes and associated with the Trinity River that most of you have probably visited. And so um, you might wonder why Tarrant Regional Water District is bringing you this information about um, you know, gardening for monarch butterflies. And that's because water conservation is a really important water supply strategy. And so um, we care about water conservation. We need to make sure that everyone's using water in a responsible way so that we can continue to provide water for this growing population that we have here in the Tarrant County area. And so SaveTarrantWater.com is our conservation facing website. So if you're looking to you know, learn anything about water conservation or look at any of our programs, our resources, Save Tarrant Water is where you wanna go. If you're a Tarrant County resident, you can actually sign up for a free sprinkler evaluation where we will send a licensed irrigator out to your house and they will, um, you know, take a look at your sprinkler system, let you know how much water you're using, let you, letting you know if you have any inefficiencies, help you out if you need any help, you know, figuring out your controller or anything like that, let you know if you have any leaks that need to be fixed, all of those type of things. And so if you have any questions about your uh, irrigation system at your home, that might be a great option for you. We also have free weekly watering advice that you can sign up for. And basically we maintain a bunch of, you know, weather stations and we look at the rainfall for, for that week or the evapotranspiration rate, you know, the temperature, all of that. And we tell you for your exact location, how much approximately you should water your lawn that week, every week. And so that's something you can sign up for, either a text message or an email um, if you wanna do that. And then we have tons of water saving tips and videos, lots of information about things, and then a calendar of events and classes, you know, exactly like this one that we are doing here today. So definitely check out SaveTarrantWater.com. And so, Again, you might be wondering why our monarch butterflies have anything to do with, you know, water conservation. And so, you know, like I said, water conservation is an important water supply strategy for us. If you're attracting pollinators, if you're attracting monarch butterflies, what you're probably doing is um, having less turf grass and more native plants that provide for these butterflies. And so native plants are generally, you know, lower water use. And so by gardening for monarch butterflies, we can all also save water, you know, save money on our water bill, but then also save water for um, future generations and use water just a little bit more responsibly. So again, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions throughout, 
you can type them into the question and answer box and I'll answer as many questions as I can get to at the end of the presentation. Um, you also have a little control panel and in there there's a handout that you can download and it just goes over, you know, it's gardening for wildlife. So it's not specifically for monarch butterflies, but it goes over much of the things that I'll be talking about today and gives some supplemental information. Um, my name is Heather Bass. I work for TRWD and I'm a conservation coordinator. If you want to get a hold of me, conservation at trwd.com is our conservation email address. So you're welcome to, to email me if you want. Um, and that's about it. So I'll get started with the presentation. I know maybe a lot of you or some of you might be here for the go and grow rebate. And so I just want to briefly talk about that. After you get done with this presentation tomorrow or perhaps right after this, you'll receive a, an automatic email. And in that email, there will be a little survey that you can do. And um, you will go in and you'll enter, you know, your information, your order number, all of that. And then once your application is approved, your um, rebate will go to whatever your payment method was for uh, your go and grow box. So if you ordered a go and grow box and you want to rebate on it, make sure you're checking your email um, with the email address that you gave just now when you signed in to go to webinar um, and make sure that you are filling out that form so that you can get your $20 rebate on your go and grow box. Unfortunately, those are sold out at this point in time. So if you haven't bought one yet, they are currently unavailable. But if you have already purchased one and are looking for your rebate, that is how you are going to get it. So again, just check your email. All right, so we're going to start talking about monarch butterflies now. So most of you pretty much probably know the butterfly life cycle, but I'll talk about it briefly. You know, the female adult butterfly is going to come in and it's going to lay an egg on milkweed. And then that egg is going to hatch into a caterpillar. When they first hatch, they're very, very tiny. You know, think about the size of like a maggot or something like that, something very small. And then they quickly grow very big. We've all probably seen the um, Very Hungry Caterpillar book, you know, that talks about how um, caterpillars pretty much, I mean, they just eat and eat and eat. And um, then they get bigger and bigger. And those different sizes that they do are called instars. And so you can see there on the right portion of the screen, there's five different instars. So there's five different sort of like growth stages of those caterpillars. And they're all different, different sizes. And you can see the size comparison there. Um, and then finally, when it gets to the fifth instar, it will connect itself up to a plant. Um, up to a stem or something, and it turns into a little J shape, and then eventually that caterpillar makes a chrysalis. Now, uh, you know, um, sometimes there's a misconception that the chrysalis is like spun or something that is, you know, made around the butterfly, but it's actually that the chrysalis is on the inside, and so that caterpillar skin is shed off, and then the inside there is the chrysalis. Um, on the picture here, you can kind of just barely see the imprint of a wing. And so once that chrysalis gets older and older and older, um, and once it's almost ready to hatch into a butterfly, it's going to get darker colored. And you're going to start seeing that imprint of the wing on the outside. And then eventually the chrysalis breaks open and it hatches into a butterfly. The butterfly comes out when it first comes out. Its wings are really small and not ready for flying yet and it kind of pumps up those wings um, and then eventually turns into what you know of as the monarch butterfly, as a regular large butterfly. And then that butterfly is gonna you know, fly off, go, go eat some you know, nectar from some flowers, and then it's gonna mate with another butterfly and then go lay an egg and your life cycle is started over again. And so that's your general butterfly life cycle. And this is for, you know, most butterflies are, are like this, but um, the monarch certainly this is how they are and so one unique thing about the monarch butterfly is that they migrate so most of our butterflies that we have do not migrate but um, the monarchs do migrate and so I'm going to talk a little bit about their migration so they overwinter in Mexico so they they go down to Mexico over the winter they're sitting there at, in Mexico right and they're um, in these trees, I've got some pictures a little bit later, um, but they sit there over the winter. And then once spring starts, they start migrating northwards. And you can see that it's multiple generations that migrate up. So it's not the same butterfly that was in Mexico that makes it all the way up to, you know, Canada. 
it's multiple generations, usually maybe like four to five different generations that happen. And this is why it's important to plant milkweeds. And we'll talk a little bit more about milkweeds later, of course, and we'll talk about how and why it's important that there are multiple generations. But um, during the spring, that is when they come through to Texas and then they come, they lay their eggs on milkweed and then another generation starts and it goes a little bit you know, further north, lay their eggs, go out to go through the caterpillar process and everything and then that generation goes a little bit further north until you know the fourth or fifth generation or so reaches all the way north there are a few you know weird things um you know a few different things where you can see the little purple area that's in florida so in south florida it does get warm enough to where there's you know there's a population there that does not migrate and they just overwinter right there in florida and they stay right there in florida but for the most part, um, what we're seeing, so those the yellow ar arrows that you see there are the butterflies coming up um, through, you know, through all the states and everything, through multiple generations and migrating up. Then they migrate back down once, you know, once it comes to fall, right, and it starts to get cold again, they're migrating back down to Mexico. Now, this is different because it's the same generation. So once they hit that fifth generation up at the top, that generation is the same one that is going to come all the way down to Mexico and is going to stay in Mexico over the winter. And so that's very important. Remember that because when we start talking about milkweeds, um, there is a big, um, big reason for that. So, now that we've talked a little bit about migration, I'm going to just so, show some pictures. This is what it looks like in Mexico when they are um, there overwintering. They get in trees and there's one region and it just fills with, you know, thousands and thousands of butterflies. And this is a big ecotourism region. So you can take a trip, a vacation to go down to Mexico and see all of the beautiful butterflies. There is a, uh, you know, a, nat a natural reserve, national reserve there where the butterflies stay and, and you can go and take a trip and go see them. So um, it's a really awesome sight. Uh, unfortunately, I've never seen it in person, but I've heard from many people that have, and you can see from the pictures here that is really, um, really beautiful. And so, like I said, they sit there over the winter until they're ready to come back up to, to our area. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about migration, I'm gonna talk about some of the, the monarch mimics. And so there are other butterflies that mimic monarchs. And you can see them here on the screen. Two of them are the queen butterfly and the vice rogue butterfly. It's really cool to think about because um, you know, they're all named after, I guess, like rulers or whatever you might want to call it. But, you know, a monarch, a queen, a viceroy, these are all, you know, high positions, rulers of, of uh, countries or things like that are called that. So, um, and you might wonder, like, why would they want to do any type of mimicry? Why are they mimicking the monarch? And that's because the monarch eats milkweeds as a caterpillar and those milkweeds have toxins in them. And it's not toxic to the, the, the caterpillar and it's not toxic to the butterfly. They love the toxins, but it is toxic to birds, right? So birds see this beautiful, you know, orange, bright butterfly and they have evolutionarily learned that um, they don't want to eat that butterfly because it's going to be toxic and they're not going to like it and it's going to make them sick, etc. And so other butterflies that may or may not eat milkweeds and may or may not be toxic mimic the look of them so that they also get that protection from birds. Um, and as you can imagine, if you're a butterfly, birds are, are one of your biggest predators. And so there's two different ones. You're looking at the queen butterfly here and the viceroy butterfly. And the main things to look at are, you know, for the queen butterfly, you're going to look at this little top part right here of the um, of the wing. You can see that at the top part of the wing and on the back side of the wing of the queen butterfly, it does not have the, the black divisions between the different cells of the wing. So if you see that look where there's no divisions in between the cells on the top part of the wing or on the back of the wing, you're looking at a, a queen butterfly. Looking at the viceroy butterfly, you can tell that it looks very similar, but it's this dividing line. So you see this horizontal black dividing line on the back of the wings of the viceroy butterfly that do not exist on the monarch butterfly. So if you see that black dividing line, you know that it is a viceroy butterfly and not a monarch butterfly. 
And then looking at the caterpillars, so the queen caterpillar looks very similar to the, um, the monarch caterpillar. The way that you can tell the difference is that the monarch caterpillars only have two sets of the little, um, you know, antenna looking things, the little kind of strings hanging out, little horns, um, whereas the queen butterfly has three sets. So a monarch butterfly is only going to have one on it, one set on its head and one set on its tail, whereas the queen butterfly is going to have a set here, you know, in the middle of its back. And so that's pretty much how you can tell just at a glance. Obviously, there are other other differences. You can see that a monarch is more completely stripes, whereas on a queen butterfly, they have kind of like dots, little um, yellow dots. And so those are some of the differences. Now, when it comes to the viceroy butterfly, um, the viceroy caterpillars, you will not um, mistake the caterpillars. The viceroy caterpillars look completely different than the monarch caterpillars and they're one of the caterpillars that actually they look like bird poo. So you know a lot of caterpillars and a lot of other insects right they mimic um, the look of, of things that are you know not edible things like leaves or sticks or in this case bird poo so that um, the birds don't want to eat them. And so um, yeah, it's so mainly just the queen caterpillar that is going to look similar to the monarch caterpillar and that, you know, you might have trouble distinguishing. But again, just that if you see those two um, little things sticking out of its back, you know that that's a queen caterpillar. And the picture that I have here, this is a picture that I took and this is on milkweed. So the queen caterpillar is eating milkweed and will eat milkweed um, and likely has some of that poison in there too. So it's not just purely mimicry, you know, based on wanting to look poisonous, it actually is also poisonous as well to, you know, to the birds. All right, so now that I've talked just a little bit about like the basics of monarchs, um, I'm going to start talking about how to garden for monarchs. And so um, the main point of this is how do you attract and support monarch butterflies in your own garden, and that is to plant native plants. You know, monarch butterflies have evolved over thousands, millions of years with our native plants that have evolved here. And so that is what they like to eat. And that is what they like to use as their um, their their life life force. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about native plants, just about how awesome they are. So native plants are really um, great for a variety of reasons, not just for monarchs, but for people, too. And so, you know, they have really deep roots. You can see on this picture here, if you look all the way over to the left here, the little tiny thing, that is your, your, your root system of your regular grass, like your lawn grass. So like St. Augustine or Bermuda, that type of thing. And so you can see how deep these roots go into the ground. And those, that really does a lot for us. And so not only are these plants drought tolerant, as you know, here, it gets very hot, it gets very dry during the summer, we can go really long periods of time, where there isn't any, um, any rainfall at all. And so one of the things that those roots can do is they can reach all the way down very, very far down, and get some of that soil moisture that is further down to make sure that these plants do not die during the summer when it is so incredibly hot and dry. But these roots do other things too. Um, they increase carbon sequestration. So we're capturing more carbon from the atmosphere. Um, it also in increases infiltration into the ground of water. So you know that we have clay soils and these clay soils when they get dry and when they get hard, um, they can be, it can be really hard to get water to infiltrate down in them. And what these roots do is they break up that clay soil so that when it does rain, you've got, you know, these little kind of um, incisions in the ground and little streams, little trails that the water can go in so that when it does finally rain, that water can infiltrate into the ground and be kept in the ground instead of just rushing over the surface. Um, and that helps clean the water. That helps keep water where, where we want it. Um, and also it helps slow water down. So not just the roots below ground, but the, the large plants above ground. If you've ever seen when it rains really hard on a short, like let's say St. Augustine lawn, you'll probably see that most of the water is just flowing straight over the top of that and not really going down into the ground. Whereas these plants have larger above ground vegetation and above ground structures. And so that water is slowed down and that water is made to stay more there. So it will soak down into the ground rather than just running over. And again, that cleans pollutants from our water as well. Um, they require less water. 
They are more drought tolerant. So when it does get really hot and dry, they're not going to die. Um, they require way less maintenance. They provide us ecosystem services. And of course, they evolved with all of our local pollinators and other local wide, wildlife. And they provide for all of those pollinators and for that local wildlife. So those are just some of the awesome benefits of native plants. And that's what we're going to be talking about mainly today, about um, what plants to plant and what things you need to provide in order to create your monarch garden. And so just like humans, monarchs need three main things, and that's food, water, and shelter. And so those native plants are going to provide food. Of course, for the you know adults, we're talking about flowers, which provide nectar. For the caterpillars, we're talking about milkweeds, which they eat. Um, they also want shelter, and so they will live down in plants. They will, you know, overnight there, hide from the wind, hide from the rain, you know, that type of thing. Um, they'll go up in trees as well. If you've ever, you know, just sat there and kind of watched a butterfly, you'll see that a lot of times they like to go in oak trees and things like that, and they'll just kind of sit there. Sometimes they're eating sap off of the trees. Sometimes they're just hanging out. You know, they, they have times when they rest and they're not always just eating and things like that. And so they need a place to rest, right? And this thick uh, vegetation that native plants offer allows them a place to sit and rest. And then you want to provide a water source, particularly in the summertime, right? When it is hot and dry. And a lot of times um, we might not, these, these monarchs might not be able to find a natural water source. And so um, you can do a variety of things, but you don't even need something as complicated even as like a bird bath. Butterflies, as you can imagine, don't need much water. And they really like a shallow dish or an area like with rocks inside a dish where they can land and they don't drown or anything, right? It's not just instantly deep water. They can sit there on a wet rock and just kind of lick up some of the water or whatever that is there. And so you can even have something, you know, as easy as just a saucer um, that you fill with water that is weighted down with rocks or even like a rock that has like an indention that holds water, something like that. Um, and, and then bird baths are fine too. If you use a bird bath, like I said, it's great to put some rocks in there like you can see there um, on the, the picture so that they have a little place to sit down and it's not just super deep for them. They like shallow water. So um, a lot of you have probably heard of the Monarch Way Station program. And so this is put on by Monarch Watch, which is an organization. And these um, Monarch Way Stations are something that you can create in your yard or in your garden. And you can apply for being an official Monarch Way Station to provide habitat for monarchs and um, provide greeting, brown, greeting ground for monarchs. And you can get a little sign that says this is a monarch way station. And so here's some of the requirements for a monarch way station. So you need at least 100 square feet. Um, these butterflies, they just like anyone else, um, they want to do what is most efficient, right? And it's not efficient for them to just go to a few little flowers and then have to fly for a long distance to another few little flowers and then fly for another long distance to another few little flowers. They want a lot of flowers all grouped up in the same area so that they can sit there and very easily get lots of different nectar um, and stick around that area for a long period of time. So you want at least 100 square foot and you want those flowers to be close together, right? Like um, you want them to be pretty full and dense. Like I said, that provides shelter as well as allows a monarch to have a more efficient existence and um, get plenty of nectar um, just in that one little area. Full sun is also very important. As you probably know, butterflies are not warm-blooded animals, right? They're cold-blooded. So they need that heat of the sun on their backs to provide them with energy to allow them to kind of get up in the morning and get their bodies moving and everything. In addition to that, flowers need, need sun. So in order to make flowers, in order to plant many of the plants that I am going to talk about today, that are flowers that are perfect for monarchs, you're gonna need full sun. So I believe the recommendation for the monarch way stations are at least six hours a day of full sun, but um, it, it's really better to have at least, you know, eight to 10 um, hours of full sun for your monarch way station. Um, at least 10 different milkweeds consisting of two different native species. It's always better, of course, to have more than 10. It's always better, of course, to have more than two species, but it's important to have a good amount of milkweeds. Um, 
let's say you just have one milkweed and a butterfly comes and lays its eggs, or let's say three butterflies come and lay three eggs, the caterpillar is going to eat that full plant pretty quickly, and then they don't have anything else to eat, and they're just going to die. And so you need multiple milkweeds, you need multiple plants, um, and then you know you want a variety of different uh, native species. And we'll talk a little bit later more about milkweeds, and we'll talk a little bit later more about um, the different native species that we have here. But you want at least 10 milkweeds, more if you can, um, and two different um, species. And you want those also grouped together. So if you're a caterpillar and you've just maybe eaten an entire uh, one plant, um, you want to be able to easily crawl over to another plant and begin eating on that one. You don't want them all spread out and everything, and then the caterpillars might not be able to find the plant. Um, for the adults, it, it's important to have flowers that bloom every season of the year. And so you want to make sure that you're having plants that are blooming in early spring, in late spring, throughout the summer when it's you know hot and dry and then also in the fall so you just want to make sure that you are having all different types of uh, diversity of different species that are allowing there always to be something blooming there and always something that is going to be a nectar source for those butterflies um, and then you're going to want to maintain this so this is you, you have to understand that you can't just plant these things and forget them Native plants are low maintenance and it's not something like a lawn where you're having to go out there and, you know, fertilize it every so often and mow it every week or water it all the time or any of those things. Certainly way lower maintenance than your average landscape, but you still do need to maintain it. And so when that comes to native plants, that means that, you know, you're going to need to water it as needed. Typically with native plants, you don't need to really water them that often, but if it is, let's say the middle of August and it hasn't rain for th two, three months, you're going to want to maybe water it a little bit. Um, in addition to that, you know, you're going to need to cut down. These are all perennials, right? So during the winter, they're going to die down to the ground um, and all the above ground vegetation is going to be dead and they're still going to be alive down at the bottom. And so at some point in time, either during the winter or the very early spring, you're going to need to come in and cut down all of that old vegetation to make room for the new vegetation to come up again in the spring. And so that is definitely something to think about. Um, and you'll want to maintain it for several years because, you know, if a monarch comes, they're going to want to come several years in a row. They're not just going to want to, you know, find it one year or it might take them more than a year maybe to find it or that type of thing. Um, in my experience, if you have good enough flowers, you know, it does not take them long to find it at all, certainly. But um, you want to make sure that you are planning for this, you know, for multiple years and it's not just a, a one and done type of thing. All right, so let's talk then about um, choosing plants. And so um, native perennials, like I said, you're going to want to have something blooming year round and you're going to want to look at high diversity. So um, different families of plants, different varieties of flowers, different colors of flowers, different shapes of the actual flower themselves. Um, and then you're gonna, again, you're gonna have groups of plants. So you don't wanna have like one of this type of plant and then one of this other type of plant and then one of this other type of plant. You know, you want at least three to five, if not more than that of each type of plant. And again, you're gonna wanna have at least two to three plants that are blooming in each season of the year. And so um, again, over 100 square feet is, is best as well. And so um, you just want to make sure that you're creating a robust garden so that you always have some resources for the pollinators. Again, we're talking about native plants. Native plants are going to be the best. Um, a lot of our non-native plants that you see um, in stores, even though they might have flowers, Sometimes these varieties are made in a way that um, pollinators don't really like them or they don't really like to visit them. Sometimes either inadvertently or on purpose, these varieties are bred to where they don't have as much nectar in them. So there's not really anything for the butterflies to eat. In addition to that, sometimes they're bred to have different flower colors. And 
these pollinators, these monarchs have evolved with these certain native flowers that have certain flower shapes and certain flower colors. And that's what they like and that's what they're attracted to. So if you take that same flower and it used to be purple and now it's a white flower, um, the pollinators might not recognize it. They might not come and be attracted to it that much. And so you wanna make sure that you're finding native plants. And so how do you find native plants? Um, I recommend definitely going to, you know, local nurseries, nurseries that you know specialize in native plants. There's also local plant sales. So right now in the springtime, there are a lot of different plant sales that are happening. Um, coming up, you know, you're looking at the Native Plant Society, things like the Discovery Gardens, um, you, you know, Native Prairie Associations, maybe even, you know, the Master Gardener plant sale, these type of things, they will have natives that you can buy. Um, in addition to that, you can go to saveterrantwater.com slash pollinator, and we have a list of local nurseries that we know carry native plants. Um, and you're going to just want to make sure that you know all the information about the plant before you buy it. So we all have phones, we all have, you know, Google or, or whatever search service you use. Um, if you find a plant and there is not a Latin name on that plant, if it's just a common name, um, you're probably not going to want to buy it because you don't really know exactly what that is. D multiple different plants can have the same common name, whereas the Latin name or the scientific name is going to be unique for each plant. You're going to be able to look it up. Um, if you're not sure, there's a USDA plants database. If you go to that database, you can type in any plant that you can find and it'll give you a map. And if you see on that map that Texas is green, that means that it's a native plant. It's native to Texas. You can even zoom in more and see exactly which counties it's native to. If you type in that plant and Texas is blue, that means no, it is not native. It is introduced. Um, if you type in that and Texas is red, that means that it is an invasive plant and you should definitely not at all plant it. Um, there's also several other awesome like plant lists that you can look at. So wildflower.org has some great plant lists. The Xerces Society at xerces.org, they have some excellent plant lists that are specifically for monarch butterflies or specifically for butterflies in this area. Um, and I recommend buying perennials. You probably want perennials, um, but if you want to add some annuals in there, you can always buy wildflower seeds. So if you're buying a perennial, I recommend buying a plant. If you're wanting annuals or wildflowers, you know, you're know you gonna want to use wildflower seeds. And if you're looking for wildflower seeds that are native, I recommend Native American Seed. They are pretty much the only seed retailer that is going to exclusively have native plants for our area. And not only native plants that are um, species native to this area, but their ecotypes or their varieties are actually the ones that are grown right here. So you know that it will match our soil type and our climate and things like that. So that is how you find your native plants. Now I'm gonna just um, start talking about some native plants that are excellent for monarchs. So first I'm gonna talk about adults, the butterflies, and then we'll go into talking about milkweeds and um, talking about what the caterpillars like to eat. Um, so in general, butterflies, you know, if, if you're a monarch, a, a monarch butterfly, an adult, you're a generalist, right? So whereas the caterpillars are very specific, they only eat milkweeds, uh, a, a adult is gonna eat from various different flowers, right? And so you're going to want to attract those with, like I said, a variety of different types of flowers. And those variety of different flowers will also attract a variety of different types of butterflies. So if you plant these plants, you're not gonna just have monarchs, you're gonna have a variety of other native butterflies as well. And so in general, Adult butterflies like, you know, bright colors. They particularly like red, oranges, purples. So these are the types of, of colors that you're wanting to look for. They like tube-shaped flowers with spurs on them. Um, they like flat flowers like asters, like the sunflower-shaped flowers, you know, that have a wide, you know, wide landing area, landing pad that they can sit on. And they like flowers with a fresh scent. And so these are, you know, your, your flowers that you usually probably think of when you're thinking of flowers, as opposed to, you know, some flowers have a rotten scent because they're trying to attract flies or they're trying to attract beetles or something like that. And so um, fresh scented flowers that are, you know, red, orange, purple, blue, that's what uh, butterflies like in general. 
So I'm just going to talk, there are so many different native plants that butterflies love, but I'm going to talk about ones that I know for a fact that I have planted in my own yard that I have seen, that I have, you know, done research on and that I've seen over and over again that I know will attract literally hundreds of monarch butterflies to your yard. And so I'm gonna start with the best ones. The first one is gonna be mealy blue sage. Some of you have probably seen the variety out there called Henry Duelberg. Um, that's just a you know proprietary variety or whatever, but it's Salvia farinacea. And um, these are beautiful, you know, dark purple typically, um, even though it's called mealy blue sage, I would more call it purple. Um, and these are great because they will literally bloom for most of the year. So you'll see them start blooming, you know, in spring, and then they won't start bl stop blooming until usually until our first frost in the fall. So you'll see them bloom all the way into, you know, November sometimes. Um, and they're great for butterflies, for also for large bees. So large carpenter bees, bumblebees, that type of thing. They absolutely love these plants. And um, this is a type of plant that will create many, many flowers continuously over the year. And so um, they also spread pretty easily. So if you just buy, you know, like a few plants, like five plants or so, eventually you will have a very large area that is going to have a lot of different um, plants and a lot of different flowers for, for the monarchs. The next um, one that is wonderful for butterflies is mist flower. And so there's two different mist flowers in our area that you can typically buy, and that's blue mist flower and Greg's mist flower. The blue mist flower is a little bit more aggressive in terms of its spreading potential. Um, so if you do plant that, you're going to kind of want to make sure that it's contained. Um, but you might want to plant it if you want something that spreads very easily. Um, both of these will bloom in the fall. And so this is, when, you know, when those monarchs are migrating back over, you'll see them a lot, you know, towards your, you know, October time period around Halloween and everything. That's when our monarchs are migrating back down south to Mexico. And that is when these plants really shine. I have seen you know, like I said, a plot of, of maybe 100 square feet, maybe even less than 100 square feet, just completely covered in this mist flower. And during October, I mean, you can walk up to that and it is just literally hundreds of butterflies will scatter off of it. So um, honestly, if you're if you're looking for like one plant to plant that is going to attract butterflies to your yard, I would say all day, every day, mist flower is the one that is going to do it. Um, and yeah, like I said, the blue mist flower, you know, basically the flowers look the exact same on them. They do have different shaped leaves. The Greg's mist flower is gonna stay a little bit more clumped, whereas the blue mist flower is gonna spread out a little bit more. And the blue mist flower, it has slightly higher um, water needs, but honestly, I have both in my yard and I do not water them whatsoever and they are both completely fine. So um, even though it's higher, slightly higher water use, you know, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, you, most of these plants that I'm talking about really don't need any supplemental ir irrigation whatsoever. You know, you'll plant them, you'll water them in, but then after that, um, you really don't need to water them at all if, if you don't want to. Um, most of them, if you do water them, you will create more flowers um, and plants will get larger, but um, no need to really water them at all. Next is one that um, you would need to water. So button bush, this is a large bush. This will grow big. Um, and by big, I'm talking, you know, eight foot tall, uh, five foot wide, pretty large. But if you have like higher, um, like wetter areas in your yard, areas that stay a little bit more marshy, this is a great, uh, a great thing to have. They have these little kind of like balls that look like little fireworks or so. And butterflies love them, not just the monarchs, but also like your other larger type of butterflies. So the swallowtails that you can see here, the uh, black swallowtail, the tiger swallowtail, um, these type of things. And so this is um, a great option if you're looking for something large that will attract butterflies. It's also a beautiful plant. And again, if you have an area in your yard that maybe stays a little bit like wetter or something like that, this is something that will be great for that. Another great plan is tur Turk's cap. One great thing about Turk's cap it is, is it will grow in the shade. So if you do have shady areas that you would like to um, have some flowers in, Turk's cap is probably where you're gonna, going to want to go with that. 
Another great thing about this is it attracts hummingbirds as well. So um, hummingbirds absolutely love Turk's cap um, as well as butterflies. And it's happy to be in full sun. It's happy to be in full shade. If it's in full sun, it will create more flowers and you will get probably more butterflies, but it blooms in the shade too. And um, this is another one you absolutely don't have to water if you don't want to. And it's also another one that will get pretty big, especially if you do water it. So this one is a more kind of like a bushy shape and will get, you know, six feet tall, four feet wide, um, those types of sizes um, if you let it. Another great one that we've probably all heard of is lantana. So um, I... I want to make a distinction, you know, there's a lot of different lantanas that you see out there and you see them with all different flower colors. And so our native one is lantana urticoids. And this is the one that you will see that is, you know, kind of like a darker orange red on the outside. And then it moves into yellow as you come on the inside. So, you know, there are other varieties that are, let's say, solid white or solid yellow, or there's a variety that's very common that has pink flowers in it. Um, for, for the sake of pollinators, I wouldn't really recommend any of those. Again, these native ones with the native flower color are the ones that are going to, you know, attract the most pollinators and the most butterflies. Um, not that the other ones won't, won't attract, you know, none, but the native one is really the preferred one. And they're all low water use. These are kind of low growing bushes that will um, trail out and spread out. And again, it's great for hummingbirds too. Hummingbirds love these type of um, trumpet shaped little uh, red and orange flowers. And so great for hummingbirds, great for monarchs. Purple cone flower. This is probably also one that a lot of people have heard of. So echinacea, it's a medicinal plant. So many of you have probably heard of echinacea, you know, in terms of like an echinacea tea or even pills, you know, herbal pills that you take. And so this is our um, our native one, which is echinacea purpurea. These are absolutely beautiful. They create really nice, um, if you're looking for something to look beautiful in front of your house, this is something definitely to, to consider. Um, and again, butterflies love it. This is the type that has a nice little you know, landing pad for them to sit on. And so butterflies love sitting there and sucking out that nectar. You know, you, you look at this and you, you see what you think is just one full flower. But actually, every single little, like, little spiny thing on here is its own individual flower. And each of our um, petals here, those are a different type of flower. So there's two different forms of, you know, flower forms that grow on this bunch of flowers that we look at and see as one flower. So anytime you look at it, like a, a sunflower or something like that, it's really a whole bunch of flowers. So each of those little things in the middle is an individual flower. And then each of the petals is an individual flower that just has one petal on it. And so, um, again, great for butterflies, absolutely beautiful, great for bees. This is one that, again, you know, you don't really need to water it that much. If you do want to water it some, you'll get definitely more blooms. And also if you want to deadhead it. So, you know, just like um, most of these flowers, if you cut off the old dead flowers, you'll get more flowers. It's not necessary. You don't have to do that. But if you want more flowers, that is definitely something that you can do. Flame acanthus is another great one. This is another kind of bushy, bushy like one. Um, it's going to be, you know, a lower growing bush than, say, your Turk's cap, but it still can possibly get pretty big. It's another one that, again, with these tubular, you know, um, red flowers, it will attract hummingbirds as well as butterflies. But monarchs love this one as well. It has a bunch of really tiny blooms on it. And so all of these, you know, you're seeing a, an up close look at it, but really they're very, very tiny. And they're a little, like I said, tube shaped, trumpet shaped. And um, so your, your bush will have a bunch of those on it and um, continue to bloom throughout the year and produce, you know, lots of flowers for your monarchs to come and get nectar from. Another great one is Wedelia or Zexmania. This one's a super hardy one. It is low growing. It is a perennial um, and it just creates just hundreds of little yellow flowers. Basically, they look like little, you know, little, little sunflowers or so. Again, you can, and you can kind of see more in this picture where each of these little things in the middle is its own individual little flower. And um, butterflies love these as well. Again, it's that same type of um flower structure where they like to sit there and they use their little, you know, their little tongue or their little proboscis to go into each little flower and suck up uh, that, uh, 
that nectar. And this is another one that will bloom pretty much throughout the whole year. And this is another one that's very hardy. It likes it hot, it likes it dry, does not need much, um, much of anything really, no, no water really whatsoever. Autumn sage is another great one. You can get this in a variety of colors. Again, for the butterflies, I recommend this um, kind of dark red. There's also a kind of dark pink color that you can get. Butterflies like both of those. You can also get in white if you prefer that. Butterflies don't like the white quite as much. Um, this is a very drought tolerant one. This is one that you can actually you know, kill if you water it too much, but um, it creates these little, you know, um, when it said a you know a tube shaped flower with a lip on it this is kind of the the flower that you're looking at when you're thinking of that type of flower shape and um, butterflies uh, love it and it creates kind of a kind of you know low little little shrubby type of plant engelman's daisy is another great little sunflower kind of looking one this is one that will just put out just hundreds of little yellow flowers and butterflies absolutely love it bees love it again this is a hardy one that needs very little care it will create a rosette at the bottom and then have stalks that come up and bloom throughout the year um, cut leaf daisy engelman's daisy uh, those are both common names for this one um, but pretty much same thing as the wadelia only a different you know same similar look um, but another great plant for monarch butterflies. And so, all right, those, so that was about 10 or so plants that I recommend for monarch butterflies. Again, there are so many more that you could plant for the adults, but those are all great natives. Um, I try to pick things to showcase here that are very easy to grow, very low um, water use, things that I know butterflies absolutely love and will attract butterflies, but also things that I know that you can easily get. So none of these are obscure native plants that you're never gonna be able to find in any nurseries. Most of these things are things that you can easily get, um, like I said, from those nurseries that specifically cater to, to native plants and then also from some of these plant sales. So next I'm gonna talk about milkweeds. And I'm gonna talk about caterpillars and what type of milkweeds to plant for your caterpillars. So I'm gonna showcase just a few that are our native milkweeds. And by native, I don't just mean native to Texas, but these are the milkweeds that are native to this portion of Texas. So Tarrant County, you will see these milkweeds growing in the wild. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them. And so if you are looking for Pretty much the, what I would say are the two best milkweeds. If you actually want to see monarch caterpillars in your yard, eating your milkweeds, you know, monarchs breeding, these are the two that you're gonna wanna look for. They are large and have a good amount of vegetation on them. So, you know, the monarchs, if they're, you know, putting one egg on a plant or a few eggs on a plant, there's going to be enough vegetation for the caterpillar to be able to sustain its life on. Um, uh, just one thing that I do want to mention, you know, if you're planting milkweeds, don't be upset when they start being eaten. You know, these caterpillars, they eat the plants. The plants will be fine. Um, they will grow back more leaves, you know, and all of that. But but definitely don't don't be upset when you start seeing your plants being eaten and you start seeing little caterpillar poops on your plants because um, that is that's what they're there for. So we've got the, you know, the antelope horns, the antelope horns, it's a little bit lower growing and you're gonna have like kind of a low mound with a lot of different flowers on it. Whereas the green milkweeds is more like a stalk that is gonna come up and raise up higher and be like an individual stalk. And it's gonna, you know, have flowers at the top of the stalk. And the flowers look very similar for both of them. They're green flowers. Um, and again, these are the ones that from my experience, you see the most in the wild here are the easiest to find and buy, have the most vegetation on them for the caterpillars and that the monarchs prefer the most. And that is really important. I'm gonna talk about some other milkweeds and, and when I talk about them, um, they're not preferred as much by the monarchs. So when, when a female monarch is ready to lay her eggs, she comes along and she scratches on, on the surface of the plant and she's smelling or feeling the amount of poison that's in the plant. And these guys have a good amount of poison in them. She sees that, she feels that, 
and she's ready to lay her eggs on them because she knows that they're going to put some good poison in there um, and, you know, make them be safe from birds, right? So um, if you are, you know, looking to make your monarch waste station and you're just going to plant two species, these are the two species that I recommend. And that's the antelope horns, which is Asclepius asperula, and then the green milkweed, which is Asclepius viridis. Next, I'm going to talk about two more. So another great one is the zygotes or side cluster milkweed. Now this one's interesting because I really see it most um, or a lot in the wild here. So out in our native prairies and things like that, you see this a lot. You also see this a lot in disturbed areas. Um, it's a milkweed that I have seen in areas that gets mowed down a lot. And even when it gets mowed down, it's just like, whatever, I'm going to pop back up, you know, and like keep growing. Um, it can be very pretty. You can see the one here is very, you know, it has this nice kind of like trail going up of flowers. Um, and the flowers are a little bit more kind of white and not as much green. And um, this is one also that I would also put in the category with the other two that I just talked about where monarchs really like to lay their eggs on them. They really feel that poison. They feel that it's a good environment for their egg and they really like to lay their eggs on it. And I see actual caterpillars on it all the time. Um, now butterfly milkweed, it's kind of a different circumstance. A lot of people like to plant the butterfly milkweed because it has a prettier flower. It has these beautiful orange flowers. And yes, it does to some people look a little bit better, you know, than these other milkweeds that I've been talking about. However, the monarchs do not like it as much. Um, this is one that stores its poison a little bit more in the roots rather than in the shoots, in the you know, leaves and everything. So it the the monarchs, I'm not saying that they don't lay their eggs on them because they definitely will. And here's a picture right here of a of a little caterpillar, you know, eating eating off of a butterfly milkweed. But they um, they don't like it as much. And you will not attract as many caterpillars on butterfly milkweed as you will on the previous three milkweeds that I talked about. Another thing is, is that it's it, they're smaller and they have smaller, skinnier leaves. And what that means is you need to plant a whole lot more of them in order to get enough vegetation for the caterpillars to be sustained on. And so if you are thinking about wanting to do butterfly milkweed, you just need to keep that in mind that um, you're going to want to plant more plants. Whereas you might, you know, the, the asperula, the antelope horns, for instance, you know, it creates a, quite a bit of vegetation just with one plant and could sustain multiple caterpillars on one plant. Whereas with the milk, with the butterfly, you might need multiple plants for just one caterpillar. And so those are all just things to keep in mind. So those are the four that I recommend the most. And again, those are because those are native to this area. And those are the ones that you can find in stores. I know right now um, I have seen at Lowe's, which is amazing. Um, tubers for the butterfly milkweed and you can buy them in like packages of like 10 or something like that so if you're looking for something you know easy you don't have to go to one of these special nurseries or anything like that um, it's really I'm, I was completely amazed that I saw that at Lowe's but they are selling butterfly milkweed right now um, and I've bought some of the tubers they came out just fine um, and so uh, so now that I've talked about those I am now going to talk about a bad milkweed and that is tropical milkweed. So do not buy tropical milkweed, do not plant tropical milkweed. And I'm gonna talk about why. First, I'm gonna say what it looks like. If you see, so you saw the, the previous, the butterfly milkweed, those are completely orange. There's no other color variation in the flowers, just completely orange. Tropical milkweed, you'll see this variation where you've got red and orange together. You'll see tropical milkweed sold sometimes under the name of butterfly milkweed. So make sure you look at the flowers because sometimes nurseries, they'll try to trick you, but don't do it. And here's why. Tropical milkweed is still out and blooming and above ground during the fall when the monarchs are coming back over. Now, remember how I talked about when they're traveling north, that's multiple generations. So they're wanting to lay their eggs and make multiple generations. Now, when they come back south, down past us in the fall, they don't want milkweeds anymore. It's one generation. We don't want them to lay eggs at that point in time. If they do, first of all, it, you know, 
butterflies, just like a lot of insects, once they breed, they die. That's just their life cycle. So once they come over and they see those milkweeds, they think that they want to breed and then they breed and then they die and they don't make it over to Mexico. Once they do lay their eggs on there, it's fall time here. By that time, it's already October, maybe even November. As you can imagine, once those caterpillars make it to butterfly, it's already too cold and they're just gonna die here um, and they're not gonna make it down to Mexico. So we want the milkweed here that is our native milkweed that is out in the springtime when we want them to lay eggs. In October, you'll see tons of monarchs in your garden. But in October or in the fall when they come, when they're going back to Mexico, you want to supply them with nectar only. You don't want to supply them with milkweeds and you don't want them to be laying eggs because it's detrimental to their populations. And so um, if you already do have tropical milkweed growing in your yard, I would say if you possibly can take it out, cut it down, plant a better milkweed, plant a native milkweed that is not going to be out in the fall and that is going to be out in the springtime. Um, if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, you want to keep your tropical milkweed, please just cut it down before fall time. You know, cut it down to the ground so the monarchs just aren't tempted. They're not tempted to lay their eggs on it. Um, and and that that's <laughs> that's my um, you know spiel spiel about the. Uh, the tropical milkweed. Unfortunately, you see it a lot being sold because it's pretty, um, but uh, please don't buy it. Please buy our native milkweeds. That's really what is best for our, our native monarchs here. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say really about the plants. I do want to say that if you're creating a pollinator garden, um, if you're creating a, an environment with native plants for monarch butterflies, you can expect to see other awesome things too. Um, you can expect to see a variety of different types of pollinators, a variety of different types of butterflies, bees, um, things even like, you know, moths, beetles, uh, birds, all those types of things. Flies, many flies are pollinators too. Not all of them are nasty, you know, like house flies or whatever that type of thing. And even cool stuff like bats. Um, you see here in this picture, these, these orange things, what you see them on right there, that is a milkweed um, bud. So what, what's about to be a blooming milkweed um, or what is about to be a seed pod. So it's already bloomed and then it's about to, you know, make some seeds. And these are milkweed bugs and you'll see them probably a lot on your milkweeds. If you have milkweeds, they're not hurting anything. They're just another animal that lives off of milkweeds. And so that's something that you might see. Milkweeds are also super susceptible to aphids. Um, typically, it doesn't really hurt the milkweed if you, you know. I would say don't treat it. Um, definitely don't, you know, don't you don't want to ever use any chemicals or anything on your milkweeds because of course the caterpillar is eating them. Caterpillar eats the chemicals, not good. But um, again, you can you can always expect to see other awesome uh, pollinators and other animals come, um, as well as you can you can expect you know other types of cool animals and predators. So once we start getting you know, our butterflies, or once we start getting our pollinators, you're going to also see predators that are going to come just as any other thing. And so things like, you know, spiders, what you see here, this might look like a bee here in the top right hand corner, but that is actually a fly that is mimicking a bee that is, uh, that kills, kills bees. And you see a little turtle there. So all kinds of, you know, cool stuff or whatever. So once you start planting native plants and creating, you know, a wild area in your garden, you will see lots of awesome stuff come to your garden. All right, so here are some great resources. I talked a little bit about this earlier, but xerces.org is great, USDA plants database. If you're ever wondering about any plant, wildflower.org has lists of plants that are all native. You can look up native plants there, um, all native to Texas. You can look up lists of plants that are great for monarchs, plants that are great for butterflies, plants that are great for bees, plants that are great for hummingbirds, whatever you're looking for. Um, you can look on our website, safedarentwater.com slash pollinator. Those are all our resources about pollinators. Um, you can also see a list of local nurseries that, again, that I know for a fact have, you know, um, some of these native plants that I'm talking about today. Uh, Monarch Watch is great as well. TexasSmartscape.com. They have native plants where you, it has a database you can look on there. You know, if you're looking for a, 
a shrub that is good for, you know, full sun and et cetera, that type of thing, you can look on there. So those are some great resources. Um, I just want to cover one more time, if any of you weren't here at the beginning, um, and you're here for the Go and Grow box rebate. The boxes are currently sold out right now, but if you already bought one and you're looking for a rebate, just please check your email tomorrow. You'll get an email tomorrow with an application in it. You will fill out the application, give us your order number and your name and all of that. And then once everything is verified, we'll send you an email letting you know that you're confirmed for a rebate and you will get $20 um, added back to your uh, whatever your original form of payment was for the Go and Grow box. So, And just remember to pick up your box at your chosen location on April 1st between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. Um, okay, and then so here are some other resources and everything. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take a look at the questions now and I'll answer a few questions. I know it's already seven o'clock, but I'll answer a few questions here. Um, see what we have. Um, there will not be any more go and grow plants. So someone asked, well, are there more go and grow plant boxes? They are all sold out right now, but there'll be more in the fall. So in the fall, the two different ones that are offered are a shade box and a pollinator box. So um, those are great options. If, you know, they make a hundred square foot garden. So if you're just looking for a pre-made box of plants that you know will be great for your um, monarch garden, wait till the fall and you can buy one of those go and grow plant boxes um, from rootedin.com. Um, let's see. What are some predators to monarchs? So birds, really a lot of birds. So um, you'll definitely see birds, you know, trying to eat them. Another really big predator for monarchs is, unfortunately, you know, there's a, um, a parasite that gets in them. And so um, when, when they're caterpillars, you will see sometimes once they make their little pupa, you'll see some kind of like, Thing dropping out of them and some webbing and that is a parasite that's inside of them that grows inside there and um, unfortunately that's one of the main things that I have seen kill caterpillars is definitely that so um, those are definitely some some predators um, the mimic monarchs don't feed on milkweed what do they feed on so some of the mimic monarchs do so the queen butterfly does feed on milkweed um, I'm not exactly sure what the viceroy feeds on, honestly. And, you know, some butterflies or some caterpillars are more generalist and can feed on multiple things, maybe from the same family, um, whereas some things really need a specific type of plant, like they specifically want, you know, milkweeds if they're a monarch, that type of thing. Um, is there a source for the native root plant root diagram? I'm not exactly sure what the source is, but if you just go, you know, on Google or whatever and search for the native um, root, na Texas native plants root diagram or something like that, I'm sure you'll see it there um, and you can zoom in and see all the cool stuff. I know there's also some, you know, like the Fort Worth Nature Center has one area where they have a mural on the wall that shows some of the root systems and things like that. So that's really cool to see as well. Um for the monarch way station status, how do you apply for that? So that is Monarch Watch is the organization. So go online, um, just search for Monarch Watch and the Monarch way station certification, and you will see how you can get certified for your Monarch way station. How close do the milkweeds um, need to be together? They definitely need to be grouped together. You know, depending on what type of milkweed you get, they're going to take up varying different amounts of space. So, you know, if you have, for instance, the Asperula, you might want to put them like a foot to two feet apart because once they get big, they will fill up that space. But if you're looking at like planting a whole bunch of, let's say, the the butterfly milkweed, those are pretty small. And so, you know, you might only want to put those like six inches apart or something like that um, in order to, you know, get them grouped together. Let's see what other questions do we have. How many of these are perennial? So all of the plants that I went over today are all perennial. Um, there are several, of course, wildflowers that are great for um, butterflies too, but I'll, all of the plants that I went over today are perennial plants, meaning they will come back year after year. They will, all the above ground vegetation will die during the winter time. You cut that off, spring, everything will come right back again from the ground. 
Um, let's see. Can you plant a monarch butterfly garden in containers or several containers? You could, but I recommend not to. If you do, please use large containers. You're going to need to water it more often because there's not that water that is sto stored in the soil. And of course, those roots aren't going to be able to get down as far as you could see in the diagram. You know, some of those roots go down like six feet down into the ground you know and obviously if you have a planter your, your planter is probably not six feet deep and so um i would say yes you can do planters if you want but most of these plants do not do well in planters and you're really going to want to plant them in the ground um what can you plant right now many perennials need to be planted in the fall um everything that i talked about you can plant right now um everything that i talked about you can get i would say starting in April, at the end of April and the beginning of May are when a lot of the local plant sales are and you can plant them then. So don't worry about waiting till the fall. You can plant all of these things right now or in the next you know, month, two months, that type of thing. Um, should we kill wasps? I, no, I, I wouldn't kill wasps. They can, yeah, they can hurt you or whatever if you want to kill them, sure. But don't use chemicals because the same chemicals that are killing wasps, um, they're also going to kill butterflies too. So I would recommend not using any chemicals whatsoever. Those are going to be bad for pollinators. Um, let's see, what else? Do the chrysalises form on milkweed or other plants instead? The chrysalises will typically form on the milkweed, um, but they will form on other things as well. I have raised caterpillars like in a, a like a fish tank or a terrarium or whatever and put just clipped milkweed and put it at the bottom and they will come and attach to like the top of the terrarium so sometimes they will lay their chrysalises on milkweed typically they will lay them on the milkweed um, or connect them to the milkweed but it can be on other plants as well um, what are your thoughts on frostweed? Frostweed is a great native that is excellent for butterflies I definitely recommend frostweed um, ironweed is great uh, goldenrod is also great. There are so many good native plants out there that butterflies love. I just covered as many as I could today with the time that we have. Um, why were plants bred to have less nectar? That's a good question. You know, when they're making varieties, a lot of times what they're looking for are other things. They don't care about the nectar. They care about the flower color or how many flowers it produces or like the look of it or maybe drought tolerance or something like that. And so they're not focusing on the nectar. And sometimes once they do that breeding, it just happens to be that the nectar um, goes away or the nectar lessens for whatever reason. Uh, the plant boxes, so the go and grow boxes, they are sold out now, but they are available to other like residents of other counties. The rebate is only available to Tarrant County residents, but if you want to in the fall buy some of these boxes, you might have to pick them up in a different county than your own, but you're of course welcome to buy them. And the Tarrant County locations are not the only locations for pickup. And Rooted In has their own you know, nursery store that you can go to and is not in Tarrant County. It is somewhere north of Tarrant County, I believe maybe Collin County, not 100% not positive. Um, okay, I think that is most of our, when do we receive the planting diagrams to prepare the beds? I believe you're talking about the go and grow boxes. I think the planting diagrams are available, like they will, rooted in, will send out, if you bought a go and grow box, they'll send out an email. And in that email, they will have, they'll, you know, remind you where to pick up your plant but then also they'll have all the information that you want. So, you know, how to care for each plant, what each plant is, different designs, if you want to follow their designs, that type of thing. You can also look at texassmartskate.com and they also have some ideas for designs as well. Is it okay to plant monarch attractive plants with other butterfly attractive plants or should your monarch plants be in a separate location from other butterfly pollinators? No. There's no reason to put them in a separate location. Most of these plants will attract multiple different types of butterflies, multiple different types of pollinators. And so you can grow, group them all together and that is completely fine. You know, um, other people like, for instance, you know, to 
plant passion vine to, to for other types of caterpillars, um, gold fritillaries, I believe that's fine. Um, things like fennel plants, that type of thing to attract the swallowtail butterflies um, and let them lay their eggs there. So you can definitely have a pollinator garden that attracts all different types of butterflies. You don't have to keep, you know, the monarchs segregated or anything like that. Um, my green mil milkweed planted in the fall did not survive our harsh winter. If I plant them now, will it be early enough? So most of our milkweeds right now have not come up yet. So if you think that it maybe didn't survive the harsh winter, you might just wait. It might be still alive underground. Um, milkweeds produce tubers. So, you know, similar to like a carrot or like a potato or something, they have pretty big like tubers. And um, once those get established, they are usually pretty hardy and won't really um, die. You know, they just stay underground. Most of my milkweeds have not come up yet at all. There's no above ground growth whatsoever right now and probably won't be for another, you know, month or so. So um, I would say give it give it a little bit of time before you think that it's completely dead. Um, but yes, if you, so you probably won't find many milkweeds right now for sale because again, they haven't come up yet. But um, in the next month or so, once you see them for sale, go ahead and plant them and they will only get bigger and bigger over the years. So you can actually plant them now and they will attract butterflies now as long as there is enough above ground growth. Um, when should you cut back your tropical milkweed in the fall? Cut it back at the end of September or beginning of October is what I would say. And then make sure if it continues to come up that you can continue to just cut it down to the ground until the next spring and then you can let it grow again in the spring. Um, oh, FYI, the guy from Go and Grow, so yeah, um, the go rooted in dudes who hosted a seminar last night said they were still finalizing designs for the boxes and they would be on their website soon. So there you go. You can find them on their website, the designs, and then also I'm sure they will send them out in, in emails as well. Um, okay. Let's see. So about rewatching this video and access, accessing the recording. So for this, um, I will probably put this on our YouTube channel in the next month or so. So you can find us on YouTube, just save Tarrant Water, search for that on YouTube. There's plenty of other awesome videos just like this on there, you know, um, about gardening for pollinators and gardening for wildlife and things like that. But if you're wanting to watch this again, I will post it on YouTube, like I said, probably in the next, I don't know, two weeks to a month. And then I will try to send out a link to everybody who registered um, with that link so that if you want to watch it again, you can watch it again. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. And I hope you learned a lot about monarchs and I hope you're excited for the monarchs to come this spring and um, grace your yard with their presence and uh, happy gardening. And I hope your monarch gardens go awesome and everyone have a good night and be safe in the weather. Thank you.